Happy Sabbath. It's a pleasure to see you guys again. Um, Barbara, is this your first Sabbath back in church or second? Nice to see you again. I haven't seen you in a while. Trish, I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, welcome, everyone. And there's some faces I don't, I don't know your names, but it's a privilege, privilege to be able to be in the house of God, and I look forward to the day when we don't have to use these things anymore. Huh? Yeah, one day. Um, let's pray before we go. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. the song there better okay all right yeah if I don't move around my brain freezes so <laughs> all right I need all the help I can get our Lord our God our creator, you created us in our mother's wombs. You saw, Lord, the pain, the difficulty that we would bring to your life. But you loved us so much, you gave us the opportunity to come out of that womb, out of millions of possibilities. Lord, we congregate on this Sabbath day as a memorial that you are our creator. And Jesus rested on, on the tomb on Sabbath after paying our redemption. So we also remember this day that you are our Redeemer. Lord, we've come here, we come here with the purpose of knowing you, our Creator. And as we open your word that brought everything into existence, we pray that your Holy Spirit who inspired these words speak and not me, Lord. Prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word and help us not to resist it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning's scripture reading was found in Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 13 through 17. Alexis, thank you for reading that for us. And um, before we get to that part of scripture, we're going to be preaching from Matthew chapter 16 this morning. Matthew chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles handy with you, turn them to Matthew 16. And we're, we're not going to be moving very much from there. And um, I'm going to set the context first before we get to that part, to the main part of the sermon. In Matthew 16, we read in the first couple verses that the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, testing Jesus, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. Now, what's amazing about this is that we see two groups of enemies. The Pharisees, which were the, the very strict, very, um, what, what would you call it, um, conservative part of the believers, with the Sadducees, who were very liberal that didn't believe in the resurrection, that believed that this life was the only one you were going to live, so you had to accumulate and enjoy as much of it as you could. Those two groups that hated each other come together to test 
Jesus. It wasn't the first time that they had asked Jesus for a sign. Actually, in the Gospel of Matthew, this is the second time they asked Jesus for a sign. The first time is found in Matthew chapter 12, 38. We're not going to look, it, look for it. But in that time, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, it's the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes were kind of buddy buddies. They were okay. But what's amazing now, it's the enemies are getting together. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend, is what's happening here. We have the Pharisees, Sadducees getting together because they have a common enemy, Jesus. Isn't that sad? And they come and they ask for a sign from heaven. Now in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, they had asked for a sign, but this time they asked for a sign from heaven. What does that mean? Now, up to this point, I have a short list. It's not exhaustive. And John, the disciple, says that not everything is written down in the Gospels because there wouldn't be enough ink and enough paper to write about what everything that Jesus did those three and a half years that they saw him. But up to this point, when they're asking for a sign, let me share this with you. At that point, Jesus had already turned the water into wine. He had done the, miraculously, the miraculous draft of fish. Remember when he called the, the disciples and told them to cast the net onto the right side of the boat? That was miraculous. That was a sign. He had cured a leper after the Sermon on the Mount. He had cured the centurion's servant with just giving his word. He had cured Peter's mother-in-law. And after that, a bunch of demon-possessed people and sick people. He calmed the stormy sea. He liberated the two demon-possessed uh, Gergenses. He had uh, healed the paralytic, the one that his friends, remember, opened the, the roof and let him down and forgiven his sins. He had resurrected Jairus' daughter. He had healed two blind men. The demon-possessed mute man. The, women with, the woman with the hemorrhage. He had resurrected the widow's son. And on Sabbath, he healed the paralytic from Bethesda, the pool of Bethesda. You remember that? The man with the withered hand, the bow down old lady on Sabbath. He had fed 5,000. He had walked on the sea. He had cured the Gentile's daughter. He had fed 4,000, and they were asking for a sign. They were still asking for a sign. I mean, what else could he do? He had resurrected two people, fed thousands of people, walked on the sea, and they still needed a sign. Well, why a sign from heaven versus just a sign? So when they say a sign from heaven, they were eluding something, something that had happened in the Old Testament. There was a couple of times when God had done signs in the heavens. Do you guys remember those stories? And they were actually more in mind re referring to the first one. There was one case, remember King Hezekiah when, he, when he's sick? And he's going to die and he starts praying and he cries out to God. And the, pro the prophet Isaiah goes back and tells him he's going to live and to ask for a sign. And he asks for the sun to go back. Remember that? Okay, that was a sign in heaven. And then the other time, do you remember Joshua? When he's battling that confederation of five uh, uh, tribes that, had, that were warring against them and... Uh, and he goes, and time's running out, and they're fighting their enemies, and the sun's going to go down, so he orders the sun to stay in place, and the moon to stay in place, which actually, he didn't know, but God knew, so God just <laughs> grabs the earth, and it stops rotating. Now, why that sign? Why a sign from heaven? 
Joshua was the conqueror. He was conquering the promised land. And for the Jewish people, all these, remember after the captivity in Babylon, idolatry was cured. Quote, unquote. After Babylon, you didn't find stories or uh, accounts of the people of Israel, of Judah, bowing down to idols anymore. We didn't have the Baals, the Astros, or any of those in the city, in the temple, in the high places, no sacrifices, no pagan worship. Now we have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. It had gone to another extreme. And you know what Satan did. Idolatry is not just physical. Idolatry can be in your heart and in your mind. And Satan applied the same thing he did to the people at the foot of Mount Sinai. And build, remember when they built the golden calf? After they had heard the voice of God say the Ten Commandments to them? After they had said, we will do that. After God's covenant with them, immediately when, they, when Moses takes too long on that mountain, Satan inspired them to build a, to, to a, a golden calf and worship it and call it Jehovah. Now that similar strategy was happening here, but with the word Messiah. Satan had gotten them to read prophecies and misinterpret and form an image of Messiah in their minds. They had formed a golden calf in their minds and in their hearts, and it was named Messiah. What's the problem with that? The problem is, that when the true Messiah came, he didn't fit the image of the golden calf in their minds and led them to reject the true Messiah because they had a fake Messiah in their minds and in their hearts. They were expecting Joshua the conqueror to come and defeat the Romans and everybody else and set Israel above the whole world. And now we have them asking the Messiah for a sign from heaven to believe in him. The creator of all things. John says in his gospel, without him, nothing was created. And we read that in Colossians as well. Paul echoes the same thing. As a matter of fact, let's go to Colossians and just read that beautiful part of Scripture. Because Paul, after his eyes were open, had a really good image of who Jesus was. Hmm. Says, in whom, I'm reading from Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are, that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Is that clear? And this is the Messiah, and we have the religious leaders asking him for a sign after all the other signs had been made. You know what the greatest sign was that Jesus was the Messiah? His character. His character. 
And as a matter of fact, that was why they were rejecting him. Because of his character. Because he was not like them. No worldly ambition. Now we have the Messiah, the creator of everything. And now Jesus went through this so many times. Do you know, can you imagine how many times he put up with things? Humiliations, rejection. Isaiah says he was a man of sorrows. He was rejected. He was despised. He was not valued. He was treated unjustly so many times. I was studying last night with a group of friends. We get together Friday evenings and uh, virtually. And we were reading the part where Jesus is brought before Pilate. And the religious leaders, because it was the Passover, didn't want to defile themselves, didn't want to be spiritually unclean so that they could participate in the Passover, didn't go into Pilate's place. They asked Pilate to come out and see them so they could be spiritually clean. To celebrate the Passover that pointed to Jesus, and they're taking the Passover lamb to Pilate, and then Pilate's there, and he's interrogating him. And I just want you to picture Jesus. His wonderful character, his dignity. He's there, silent, majestic, humble. He's not fearing. He's not trembling. He's not quaking. He's not defending himself. He's not fighting. He's not proud. He's not haughty. And he's our creator. Our Redeemer, the image of the invisible God, and He's standing there before this earthly governor. And that man is questioning Him and says, Don't you know that I can, you know, your life is in my hands? I'm paraphrasing. Jesus says, My, my kingdom is not of this earth. Jesus went through that so many times. Times. Now let's keep on with, with the reading. We'll go back to that point later. Verse 13. When Jesus came into the... Um, um, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Which was our scripture reading. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying... Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Sounds almost like a tongue twister. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He set them aside and asked them. It's a very important question. Now listen to the answer because it's pretty sad. It says, they responded in verse 14. Some say John the Baptist. Where was John the, the Baptist at that point? They had chopped off his head. You know, Herod was the one who, who thought that, that Jesus was John the Baptist resurrected. And he was back to haunt him. Some say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. You know what they're saying here? They don't think you're the Son of God. They don't think you're the Messiah. His people, the ones he came to. John says that he had created the whole world, that that, wor that word became flesh, and he came to his own, and, to, and his own didn't know him. They rejected him. They did not receive him. And when they're saying something, say you're John the Baptist, you're 
Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, they're saying, they haven't received you. They've rejected you as the Messiah. And then Jesus turns around and asks them a very direct question. In verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? You who have walked with me for two years now, two and a half years almost at that point, who do you say I am? You have walked with me. You have shared meals with me. We have slept under the stars together. You have worked with me. You have confided in me. I have taught you. I have corrected you. I have walked with you. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter was always the first to answer, right? He got it right this time. He says, you are the Christ, which is a word for Messiah in Greek. El Cristo, the anointed one. The Christ. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And there's a wonderful truth here. And it's kind of interesting. If God, God is the one who reveals who Jesus is. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of us pray and want the Holy Spirit. And we, there's a lot of talk of it in Christian churches and other denominations. And we see uh, spiritual healers and they do miracles and they speak in tongues. And they have all these things talking about the Holy Spirit. But do you know what his primary job is? Is to reveal who Jesus is to us. When you ask for the Holy Spirit, are you wanting that? Now, Jesus says that to Peter. We all know those verses. And I also say to you, you are Peter, which means a stone, a rolling rock. And on this rock, and he uses the word Petra, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom to, of heaven. He's talking about the church, not Peter. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus, the Christ. After all this, why would Jesus tell them not to tell people he was the Christ? You don't think the disciples in their hearts, in their minds are like, why doesn't Jesus do it? Why doesn't he give them a sign? He, you know what the sign could be? Hey, call down fire from heaven and burn them. Win-win. Hey, you kill two birds with one stone. You know, Jesus, if, if, if maybe I would have been to thank God, and I'm, I'm not right, but I would say, oh, you want to know who I am? Let me show you. You know. Roast them there, do something. Scare them at least. There was a pastor who had said that one time uh, he was talking to some rebellious, rebellious youth in the church and they had done something in the church graffiti or something. He was getting after them. And they were so disrespectful of God and they were like, we don't believe in God. And, blah, blah, blah. and the pastor was there and he was praying inside and he says, God, please scare them. And the, guy, the kid said, if God is real and stuff, and you know, let him strike me down right now and kill me. I don't believe. And he, the kid said that. And the pastor inside kind of just stepped a little bit back. And he, he was like, God, at least scare him. Un sustito. 
you know, do something. Why wouldn't it have been so easy for Jesus to do something, to give them that sign? Why didn't he? And why is he telling the disciples not to tell anybody that he's the Christ? Isn't that what he would want people to believe? The truth? Why is he telling the disciples to hide the truth? Because of the golden calf. Because Satan said, well, I can't get him to, to stop believing in God. I can't get him to bow down before an image. But what I can do is twist the image of God in their minds and in their hearts. Same name, different definition. If people will hear, oh, Jesus is the Christ, then they would believe he's the conqueror. He's Joshua. He's coming to, to, to get rid of the Romans and everybody else. And it would have hurt the work that Jesus was doing in revealing God's character to them. Nobody wanted anything to do with the suffering Messiah, the suffering servant. As a matter of fact, that was the basis of, of Satan's temptations with Christ, his whole ministry here on earth, was trying to get him to stop being that lamb that was going to die for you and for me. And to get him to show the conqueror. Now Jesus goes on and he says, verse 21, from that time, from that time. What does that mean when you're reading something? From that time. It's linking it to what you just read. After it's revealed that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus gets to the point. He didn't ask just because he was curious. As a matter of fact, the spirit of prophecy says that he spent the night before in prayer because this is what he was going to reveal for the first time to them since they were following him, his disciples. He says, from this time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day from this time. This is the first time Jesus reveals the biggest truth, the, the, the point of him coming to earth, the, the, the climax of his mission. His sacrifice on Calvary. Then... Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. What? Saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Peter takes him aside, you know, he was on a spiritual high. Lord, come on, don't talk like that. That's crazy talk. That will never happen to you. You're the Messiah. You're the conqueror. So even though Peter had revealed with his mouth, you are the Christ, son of the living God, he really didn't know who he was standing next to. As a matter of fact, the words come back to my mind when he calmed the stormy sea. After he calmed the stormy sea, they all look at each other. They're all silent. Peter didn't talk. The only question that was raised was, who is this man? who the wind and the waves obey. That was one of the hardest things that Jesus put up with here on earth, his loneliness. Never being comprehended, he was alone in this mission of our salvation. And no man stood with him. Remember that verses where he, he, he tread the grapes and no one was there with him? Not even his closest friends, the disciples, really knew who he was. 
And Jesus says some of the harshest words that we've heard him say. He says, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, it's all linked. We read from this time, now we're reading then. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is, is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, please pay attention to this. Do you think that before Jesus comes again, which is pretty soon, Satan will not try to do this same strategy with us? Could it be that we can confess with our mouths that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, but in our hearts and in our minds we don't know him? Remember, Jesus warned, not everyone that calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says, and some will say, Lord, in your name we did miracles and we cast out demons and we heal and we did this. And we prophesied. And he'll say to them the sad words, I never knew you. I never knew you. Is it because he didn't know us or because we didn't know him? Could it be that we are Seventh-day Adventists? And we have a lot of truth, but we don't have the man truth in our lives. Could it be that Satan has formed a golden calf in our minds and our hearts, and we call it Jehovah? That's why Jesus said, this is life eternal in John chapter 17, verse 3, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You see, Jesus said that he was going to be, he was going to suffer and he was going to be killed. And then in verse 24, he says, take up your cross. He was giving hints of what was coming. He was trying to prepare them. He knew that they had all these prejudices in their minds. All these expectations. What are your expectations? And do they include a cross? How many of us, when we accept Jesus into our lives, are looking forward to carrying a cross? A symbol of suffering, humiliation, and sacrifice. How many of us are willing to do that? Aren't most of us looking forward just to the crown? And in our daily lives, when we come into affliction, we come into problems, we come into trials, our faith withers because our expectations were of the conquering Messiah, of a Jesus that was going to come into our lives and just give us victory after victory after victory and put before us a freeway Nicely paved, no bumps on the road. Or how many of us thought that we would go through the baptismal waters and then Jesus was waiting for us to wave his magic wand and now we have conquered all our weaknesses, our love of sin, our bad habits, all went away. 
We went through the laundry and we washed all that off. Baptism is the symbol of dying to self. Of taking up that cross, of dying with Jesus and resurrecting to a new life. Who do you say that I am? We might say it with our mouths, but what are we saying with our lives? Who are we saying Jesus is? But Jesus doesn't leave them there. That's not the full gospel. Verse 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with the angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus is so loving, so patient. God is not the way we paint him so many times. We are very hard and unforgiving and very resentful and a whole bunch of other things. And because we're like that, we picture God like that. But we see here Jesus dealing with his unbelieving disciples day after day. And in their weakness, and he's revealing these great truths to them, and they don't want to hear them. He reminds them that everything that he's going to do is for the goal of wiping out sin, death, suffering, and the separation between us and our Creator. And restoring things to how they were in Eden before sin entered. A life without suffering, without pain, full of everything that we would need to be happy. Intimate communion with our Creator. And He shows them that. You don't understand, I'm pointing to a cross, I'm pointing to suffering, and it's dashing your dreams. But the end result is this. And He that some of them now, and some read the Bible and say, well, you know what? Jesus lied or he messed up there because he didn't come and they were all dead when he, you know, he hasn't come yet and all the disciples are dead. But if we keep reading in Matthew chapter 17, it says, now after six days, now when you read now after six days, Matthew again is tying what just happened. He says, now. We don't start a conversation with now if we weren't having a conversation before. You'd be lost if all of a sudden I saw you today and I say, now, Pastor Duncan, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, wait, what are you talking about? And he walks up the mountain. He takes his three closest disciples, the ones with the hardest heads and the worst characters, Peter, James, and John. He walks up all night to the top of the mountain. They're tired. They fall asleep. Jesus is praying. And Jesus is transfigured. And I think the light woke them up. And they wake up and they see Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. Oof. Talk about a sign. Don't you think the disciples are like, man, why didn't he do that down there when they were wanting a sign? Imagine if Moses shows up and Elijah and he tells them, hey, you dummies, this is the, the Messiah. This is God here. What's wrong with you? What more, what a bigger endorsement would you want for the Jewish people? Moses and Elijah, the two biggest prophets in Israel's history. But they weren't there by chance. Moses had died and been resurrected. Elijah had never tasted death. And in that, the, the kingdom of God was symbolized. The ones that are going to be resurrected 
and the ones who are not going to taste this, the end mission, the goal. But there's more to that. In Luke, it tells us what they were talking with Jesus. It says that the subject of their conversation was, their, was his coming sacrifice that he was going to do in Jerusalem. Why Moses? Why Elijah? Moses knew what it was like to put everything on the line. He came up to God after that incident with the golden calf. And he said, Lord, God had proposed, hey, step aside. I'll wipe them out and I'll start over with you. And Moses intercedes. He said, blot my name out from your book that you have written, the book of life. Moses is saying, I would rather die that they would live. Were they lovely people? They had wanted to stone Moses when they ran out of water. They had done nothing but bicker and complain ever since they were rescued from Egypt. They had made his life miserable. How was it possible that he loved them? They were so unlovable, ungrateful, undeserving. But Moses represents Jesus. He says, strike my name out. I'll die, let them live. Moses knew what it was like to intercede and to love these people that were rejecting him. Elijah, Mount Carmel, in front of the whole, he knew what it was like to be the most hated man for three and a half years. Every time they were suffering, the people were suffering because they didn't have anything to drink. They cursed Elijah. Every time they lost an animal, livestock, every time they didn't have food, every time they lost a loved one, they cursed Elijah. They blamed Elijah for all their grief. Elijah knew what it was like to be alone on the face of the earth, to be hated, to be despised, to be rejected. While he was serving and doing the will of God. He was being rejected. He was being despised and hated. Because he was being faithful to God. And he knew what it was like to stand on a mountain. Against all these priests of these false gods. And stand alone for God. And those two men are standing with God who has become man and they're conversing of what he's going to do in Jerusalem. And Peter wakes up in a daze. Oh, Lord, it's a good thing. Hey, let's make uh, some temporary shelters here and let's just stay up here. This is perfect. We'll just stay up here. He didn't know. The Bible says he didn't know what he was saying. He was half asleep. And then the voice of God is heard. This is my beloved son. Hear him. In whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Brother and sister, what's the point of this message this morning? Who are you saying Jesus is? I've said this plenty of times in different messages, but I guess the question is, is God, God in your life? Are you sure you have the right image of God in your mind and in your heart? Is the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus to you? Are you seeking to know him? Are you willing to take up that cross? 
Time is running out. Time is running out. We might have little spots of peace and tranquility, but brothers and sisters, everything that's been happening these past years is God calling us to wake up. He who tries to save his own life will lose it. What does that mean? If you live for self, the ironic thing is you're going to lose yourself. The only way to be saved is to go through that fire that you don't want to go through. To go through the pain, to go through the battle of denying self. The worst, the most fierce battle that you and I have had to fight is not against Satan, it's against ourselves. And I pray to you, pray this morning that God help us obtain victory over self, that that golden calf be taken out of our minds and our hearts, and that we may come to know God as it is our privilege to do, to do and that we may let others know God through our lives. Let our lives say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. God bless you this morning.